Hello. Uh, so I'll be talking about some of the lesser known primitives around multi-core synchronization. Uh, just a bit of background about myself. I'm Sami Bahra. I co-founded Backtrace a couple of years ago. We build debugging technology for natively compiled software. Uh, for the last decade or so, I've primarily been focused on scalability, reliability, uh, and then in academia, I was involved with heterogeneous architectures and PGAS languages. Uh, I've spent a bulk of that time working on uh, multi-core synchronization. I created a project called Concurrency Kit, which is part of the FreeBSD operating system and used by several companies for uh, performance slash reliability requirements. So what we'll be talking about is uh, sort of the advancements that have occurred over the last 27 years in uh, concurrent and parallel synchronization. It's a lot of material, so we are going to do broad strokes. Uh, due to the fact that there is a lot of material, I do ask that you hold questions until the end, uh, and I'm also happy to discuss offline. So the most interesting thing is, despite all these advancements, most folks don't actually make use of these. You know, the, the mutex and standard libraries, the most runtime systems that you've worked with are using an implementation from you know, the late 80s, essentially. Uh, so what are we going to cover? Uh, first, we're going to start with, I'd argue, a bit more boring stuff. We'll start with very basic uh, concurrency primitives, so atomic operations uh, and various other uh, hardware support for uh, concurrent slash parallel applications on multi-core. And then we'll be covering blocking synchronization, which is what most folks are familiar with these days. So your typical mutex, read, write, lock, uh, condition variable, et cetera. And then we'll be covering uh, more interesting synchronization primitives, including you know, block-free data structures, et cetera. Uh, so, what I want to focus on as far as the concurrency primitives are concerned is so what standard language runtimes lack as far as uh, support for underlying hardware features. Uh, so before the era of standard atomic, it was essentially uh, a shit show. You had you know, a myriad of libraries out there which implemented atomic operations. They were mostly incomplete. They failed to provide a consistent memory model, et cetera. So standard atomic does solve most of that, uh, but there are still features that do require developers to you know, provide their own abstractions. And typically, that's, that's in the form of inline assembly. Uh, so on x86 in specific, there are plenty of atomic operations which are not supported in standard, uh, standard atomic. So if you are looking for implementing something that is purely weight free, that is lacking. What's worse, at least with standard atomic, is all what's exposed to you is, is block free. So if you want stronger bounds, uh, if you want introspection into stronger bounds uh, with respect to forward progress, you don't really get that. Uh, what's, of what's of particular interest here is increment with zero flag, decrement with zero flag. Uh, so on x86, you'd have lock inc, uh, the lock inc instruction, lock dec instructions, which will set the zero flag. Uh, if the value decremented to or from is uh, zero. This is a very important construct if you're doing reference counting or implementing various uh, blocking synchronization primitives, and there, are, there is a real performance difference uh, compared to XSAD or fetch and add. Uh, and you would think that standard atomic, you would think that C++ compilers would be able to optimize this. Uh, unfortunately, they, they typically don't. Uh, this example program is compiled with GC, and what we're doing is storing the value zero in some variable, incrementing it by one, and checking whether the previous value was zero. And this, again, it compiles down to an XAD instruction, which is significantly more expensive. Uh, so it's not uncommon to find yourself in situations where you are, uh, when, when you're in a situation where you have to implement highly optimized synchronization primitives, you do still have to resort to inline assembly. Uh, another area that is lacking, uh, and this is true of every programming language that I know of, is uh, load length and store conditionals cannot be uh, directly utilized. So most languages will expose uh, compare and swap, uh, but they will not expose LLSC, and that's due to the fact that there are uh, restrictions. 
so for are folks familiar with load link store conditional? Okay, so what can you see my cursor? So for example, what we're doing here is we're essentially loading uh, this pointer into the variable head, and then we're doing a store conditional on head with a node. This is an example, you know, stack uh, push, a broken stack push implementation, actually. Uh, but if head was modified between the load linked and store conditional, the store conditional will fail, and typically you would retry. So uh, the beauty of this primitive is unlike cast, you could actually detect mutations to the, the target, even if the target has the same value. Uh, the issue with cast is you have to speculate only on the value. So if you're implementing more advanced synchronization primitives, uh, you, know, you end up having to play other tricks. Once, once we get into block-free algorithms, I'll touch on this again. Uh, so this primarily affects architectures such as ARM and power. Uh, other issue, and this is slightly more, a uh, little bit more minor, and there are other examples, is you don't really have interfaces for, uh, you know, architecture-specific pause instructions. So if you are implementing any form of busyweight algorithms or some form of an adaptive algorithm where you, you busyweight and fall back to something that's blocking, uh, typically you have to rely on compiler intrinsics such as mmfence, etc. And this uh, helps in that, uh, at least depending on your architecture, it avoids situations where you do starve the pipeline. So if you are using hyper-threading, this can make quite a difference. Uh, and then last uh, but not least, as far as these basic primitives are concerned, uh, at least on Intel, one thing that was introduced recently is a prefetch W instruction, which allows you to read for ownership uh, or load a value from uh, into your cache with an intent to write. This can eliminate a significant amount of cache coherence traffic. Uh, this is a fairly common pattern in concurrent algorithms. You may load a value from memory and then eventually perform a write. Uh, so with the popular cache currency protocols of today, this involves a significant amount of traffic. You would have to supply the reading core for reading and then broadcast and request you know, all cache lines which hold the value, or if it's a writer, uh, to transition to a shared state. And then as you write, you have to invalidate all the cache lines. Um, so this can actually be eliminated into a single operation if you do use this uh, instruction. Uh, and then more interestingly is uh, later Intel x86 and Power 8 processors also support restricted transactional memory. The typical use case is block lesion. So for example, over here we have, you know, thread zero acquiring a lock and then mutating some element of this array. Thread one holds a lock and mutates some other element of the array and then unlocks. In this case, obviously, they are serialized. Now what's cool with lock lesion, so over here we are doing lock lesion, uh, these can actually execute in parallel. Uh, so there are some restrictions in that the, the target memory addresses need to be on separate cache lines. Uh, so this is an example of something that isn't directly exposed in C++. Uh, there is, a, a, how can I say, there, there is a proposal for a transactional memory interface, but it does come at a cost due to the fact that A is generalized, B it doesn't really expose uh, the semantics of restricted transactional memory. Uh, so the key thing to note with restricted transactional memory is uh, there's no forward progress guarantee. There's no guarantee it will ever succeed. So typically you do have to implement a fallback. And just as any you know, synchronization primitive, how you, uh, how you back off, how you, you know, fall back to a blocking path does require fine-tuned control if you want to achieve high performance uh, or high predictability. Uh, and uh, at least on x86, abortions uh, not only can fail due to architectural constraints, but also application-specific reasons. So an app it is possible for an application to uh, communicate the reason for the transaction abort. So in the case of concurrency kit, for example, we have uh, some heuristics in there to detect you know, high frequencies of aborts and dynamically fall back to a blocking path, and we specifically make use of these uh, abort codes in order to achieve that. Uh, 
All right, blocking. Well, actually, before I move on, let, let's actually try to do uh, questions after every section. So are there any questions on uh, the concurrency primitives block that we covered? I wonder if uh, in Intel software products, like in their compiler or in their libraries, are they using these uh, less known uh, synchronization primitives internally? Uh, so the question is, is Intel using this stuff in their own software? Uh, yes, they are, and they do have engineers uh, working on this uh, for standard libraries. So glibc, for example, does have lock elision support. Uh, so yeah. Um, the question about the load runs for conditional. Um, uh, how does that interact with like, if you're in a multi-threaded environment, or like, if you contact the sticks in the middle? Typically, you'll just abort. So okay. the store conditional will will uh, the store conditional will fail. Um, now, it, it's actually not so bad in, in the real world. Abort reasons do assume you know assuming you don't have like a million processes pinned to uh, a core. Uh, typically speaking, you won't run into aborts due to this. It's a very low occurrence. I can share some stats that I collected on this a while ago. Oh, I didn't repeat the question. And the, the question was, uh, what is interaction of LLSC in a concurrent system where you have multiple threads on a given core? Cool. All right, blocking synchronization primitives. So these are what most of us are familiar with, mutexes, read write locks, condition variables, et cetera. Uh, there have been a lot of advancements uh, over the last you know, 30 years plus in this area, and unfortunately we don't utilize them. Uh, the first thing that uh, I wanted to touch on is there are a myriad of spin lock and mutex algorithms out there with varying fairness and scalability guarantees. It goes well beyond you know, the simple uh, mutex that we see today. Uh, I won't cover the specifics of the table, but this more highlights uh, some potentially interesting keywords for folks. Uh, there are plenty of them out there. Uh, what, a couple of things I did want to touch on. So one is starvation freedom and fairness. This is especially important on NUMA. Pretty much everything is NUMA today. You do have ver some very weird artifacts due to this. So for example, uh, over here I have the cost of, uh, well, the throughput of uh, get time of day uh, on different uh, cores on a system. So all I did was loop, call get time of day repeatedly, and then pin the process on separate cores and measure the throughput relative to pinning to the first core. And you can actually see a significant decrease in throughput due to this. This is an example of uh, a NUMA factor. So in Linux, uh, you have the VDS VDSO stuff pinned to core zero. You have a shared page for these types of system calls to avoid a context switch into the kernel. And this is typically pinned on the first socket. So the further away you move uh, on the first core, the further away you move from that core, the more expensive that call becomes. Uh, you also see this with locks. So for example, over here, uh, we have a simple benchmark and it is a compare and swap loop. And what we're doing is uh, running, well, running the threads on different uh, cores. And you could see uh, a lot of, uh, you can see a fair amount of starvation here. So the throughput across threads wildly varies, and the thread that happens to own the, uh, own the memory where the lock is located has significantly higher throughput. Now there are blocks that provide fairness. Uh, so over here is an example of an MCS lock, which is a scalable Q lock, and I'll get into what scalability means in this context, and you can see it's fair. So you have forward progress guarantees, you don't have the issue of starvation. Now, unfortunately, this fairness does come at a cost. So uh, depending, well, frankly, in, in most implementations, you will run into a, a significant decrease in system-wide throughput if you have any form of uh, jitter in your system. So what do I mean by scalable locks? Uh, so, uh, a scalable, an unscalable lock will degrade performance under contention. So uh, this is uh, 
a graph from some work that David Laura Bresso did for the Linux kernel. There was essentially a giant lock in uh, the file system. He replaced it with an MCS implementation. So what you have here is an example of an unscalable lock. So this is a typical lock you'll find in your standard library. And you'll see that performance deg uh, degrades uh, once load increases. What you want, ideally, is saturation, and you want to maintain peak saturation. And the blue line is uh, an example of this, uh, of this. So over here, he simply replaced MCS, and boom, things performed significantly better. Uh, so you had around 2.4x increased throughput. Mm, all right. Uh, it's just transactions. Good question. I think this is the number of cores, I believe. Yeah. Um, let me let me find out. It's been a couple of years since I read this paper. Any other? Oh, question. What is the line? Answer. I don't know. All right. Uh, so you also have uh, a lot of vari uh, variety as far as read-write locks are concerned. Uh, so read-write lock is an example of asymmetric <coughs> synchronization. Uh, this table and it simply communicates the variety. Uh, you know, feel free once you get the slides to Google uh, some of these and you'll find interesting results. We are going to cover a few of these. So the concept of scalability and fairness uh, still apply. I wanted to cover some of the more interesting primitives here. Uh, can you clarify those 1A, 0F? Uh, sure. So A is the number of atomics on the fast path, and then F is the number of uh, fences, on, at least uh, on non-TSO architectures. Uh, so a very interesting uh, modification of the read-write lock is a big reader lock. This is used fairly heavily in the Linux kernel. In FreeBSD, you have a similar thing called uh, read mostly lock, and what it does is it achieves perfect scalability for readers at the cost of, uh, at an increased cost for writers. Uh, so all you do, if you are familiar with uh, Rybos read write lock, and I'm happy to cover that uh, after, is simply distribute read side nodes. So rather than having readers uh, uh, mutate a shared counter to indicate that they are uh, acquiring or attempting to acquire a read side critical section, you distribute those counters and every reader has their own counter. And then the writer, when it is looking to acquire the right side path, iterates over all these nodes. Uh, obviously, there is a cost here, and the cost is you'd have increased memory usage for readers. Uh, another very interesting thing is biasing. So most read-write locks that we do work with out there uh, tend to be write bias locks, which can lead to all sorts of interesting live lock and starvation for uh, readers. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, improvements to this. One is task fair locks, where you have a guaranteed fairness with respect to uh, lock acquisition attempt order. Uh, so uh, uh, acquirers are granted the lock in order, essentially, uh, with respect to their phase, read or write. And you also have phase fair locks, which uh, provide fairness with respect to readers and writers. So you have uh, forward progress guarantees for both readers and, and writers. And, and many, what you have here in this chart is uh, an example schedule of a write bias lock versus a phase fair lock. And uh, you see an example of, um, in this particular schedule, you see that uh, overall system completion time is, uh, job completion time is reduced due to the fact that you have fairness between read phases and write phases. Uh, so there are implementations uh, available of this, open source implementations available of this that you could use today. And uh, depending on your workload, it's plug and play and, and you'll get performance improvement, assuming you have sufficient contention. Uh, another thing that's very interesting is uh, sequence lock. So as far as biasing is concerned, this is extremely right biased. Readers are, uh, can spin indefinitely, but essentially all what you do is on the read side is read a version counter, load fence, copy, do a, a, you know, a deep copy of a relevant data structure, read the version counter again, and if it hasn't changed, then you are good to go. If there is an active write, you block and wait for that 
uh, write to uh, complete. Uh, and on the right side, all you do is increment a counter twice. Uh, so depending on your implementation, that's simply two store operations. So it's extremely, extremely cheap on the right side. This construct was heavily used in uh, the Linux kernel. Uh, and uh, you know, at least for my code, I, I use this pattern quite heavily as well. Uh, all right, any questions on blocking synchronization? Cool, so there's a, a lot more interesting stuff here. So just due to time constraints, I unfortunately will not be touching on event counts, uh, event counters, which are lock-free replacement for uh, condition variables. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, do you have to know ahead of time how many threads you have? What, or how do you know what reader is yeah. actually allocating the list of reader? That's up to your implementation. So at least in, oh, so the question is, if you are using a big reader lock, do you need to know the number of uh, reader threads ahead of time? Uh, no, you don't have to. It really depends on your implementation. So at least in kernel space, typically that's managed on a per CPU basis and user space, uh, at least implementations I've written, are, they are dynamically allocated. Uh, yeah. And another nice thing too is obviously you could use the big reader lock itself to manage that list of threads. So it's fairly trivial to, to implement dynamic allocation there. All right, so how can we ensure stronger progress guarantees, both for the reader and the writer. This is where non-blocking synchronization comes in, block freedom, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But what we're gonna focus on first is uh, safe uh, memory reclamation techniques. Uh, so unfortunately in, in the real world, if you have readers and writers, any amount of writes will typically read to, lead to a significant performance degradation to readers. Uh, now, the typical approach to uh, at least improving this is to decouple liveness and reachability. So you'd use something like reference counting, you would have a lock around an index, and then you would uh, essentially acquire a reference to an object with the lock held, and then you can remove that reference without the lock being held. This way you can have long-lived references without blocking forward progress on uh, the right side. Unfortunately, this is fairly, fairly expensive, and uh, again, it uh, at least traditional reference count with tra traditional reference counting, it does imply blocking uh, for both readers and writers on that initial acquisition of uh, a reference. Uh, so you have more advanced techniques uh, which fall under the umbrella of safe memory reclamation, which protects against read reclaim races, where a read reclaim race is a situation in which a writer physically destroys uh, an object that is being actively read by other threads. Uh, so this can be uh, done with minimal to no interference to, to readers. It's, uh, this construct is, uh, or these techniques are heavily used in a lot of uh, high performance concurrent programs these days, heavily used in Linux kernel in the form of RCU and now FreeBSD recently has uh, an implementation built on uh, epochs. Uh, and we'll touch on this shortly. So what we have in this chart here is an example workload. Uh, it's a read, uh, this is actually a read only workload uh, or read, highly read mostly workload. And uh, you have a bunch of, uh, the X axis is a number of concurrent processors which are acquiring uh, references to objects. And then the y-axis is uh, CPU ticks, uh, some processor who I, which I did not label here. Uh, so what you can see here is as the number of, uh, as the amount of parallelism increases, um, the cost of uh, you know, a centralized read-write lock uh, also increases. Uh, and then the same thing with uh, uh, reference counting as well. You can see that the big reader lock scales perfectly, and then the ideal case is a concurrently readable data structure. So this is a data structure where you don't have any writes for uh, if you're doing reads. Uh, so uh, a very simple algorithm to implement this, developed by Magid uh, Michael, is uh, hazard pointers. Uh, so all what a reader does is before it, 
it reads a, a pointer to a reference to some object. It stores a reference to that object in some globally visible list, executes a strong memory fence, and then checks whether the target uh, region that it's trying to read uh, has been mutated or logically deleted. And if it hasn't, then it knows that it's safe to continue accessing that object. Uh, so it's fairly simple. The cool thing here is it does work with more advanced uh, concurrent data structures. You know, the simplest use case is, let's say you're publishing some pointer that you want to share across threads. This is a very way to uh, ensure, uh, to protect the program against read, reclaim races uh, while uh, in essentially a, a scalable manner, right? There are no writes to shared memory or anything like this. So it'll scale perfectly. Uh, and then on the right side, similar to, you know, if you're using reference counting, uh, you have a logical delete stage and then you have a physical delete stage. So in the logical delete stage, you execute the logical delete. Over here we set uh, the pointer to null. Uh, this is pseudocode, so assume that the appropriate atomics are being used. You execute a strong memory fence and then uh, to guarantee visibility there and then you defer the target. And then you have the actual physical deletion step and in the physical deletion step, you scan the hazard pointer slots of all threads and if no one has uh, the region of memory you're trying to phys physically destroy held, uh, then you could go ahead and destroy it. Uh, Maybe we'll go back to the read slide. So in this case, even during unsuccessful reads, will it still push uh, the target you read? Push is a bad name. Hazard set is set. a better name. Okay. Yeah. So we'll not push into it. Okay. Correct. Yep. Uh, so obviously the downside, so the nice things are you do have provable bounds on memory usage. Unfortunately, the sucky things are that you acquire additional space for every hazardous reference. So if you have something like a concurrent, concurrently readable linked list, uh, well, in that case, you require two, but if you have a concurrently readable tree, uh, you will require the number of hazard pointer slots scales with the number of, uh, well, the height of the tree, the number of nodes that you're going to have to touch. Uh, so that's one issue. Another big issue is you do require a full memory barrier on the fast path uh, as well. So alternatives exist, but they do require right side blocking. So uh, I call these passive mechanisms in that you don't have to modify your data structures or anything like that to really take advantage of them. Uh, they ensure uh, a very performant read side at the cost of right side progress. So central to all these schemes is this notion of grace period detection. So what we have here is thread zero attempting to physically delete some region of memory, and thread one and thread two are performing concurrent reads. Uh, now the key thing to note here is after the writer performs a logical delete, there's a synchronized operation which essentially blocks until all active reads are complete. Once uh, that occurs, it's guaranteed that the logical deletion is globally visible to all threads, so no threads can acquire a reference to the object that's been logically deleted, and now the physical deletion can uh, occur. So this is sort of the commonality across all these mechanisms. So you have RCU in Rust, you have epoch reclamation, uh, etc. On the read side, uh, what you have are essentially uh, typically two types of uh, operations that are similar to read write locks. You have a begin and an end, or in the case of RCO, read lock, read unlock, uh, and all potentially hazardous references. So if you're reading regions of memory, which could be concurrently mutated or destroyed from or underneath you, they have to be within these protected sections. So as long as you're in a protected section, it's guaranteed that the objects you've, acqu you've acquired references to will not be destroyed. On the right side, uh, what you do is uh, after the logical delete, so over here what we have is uh, the writer gains a reference to some object and then it sets, uh, it essentially deletes that object and then it performs a synchronized operation. It waits for all current readers to complete, at which point it's guaranteed that no readers will be able to acquire a reference to said object and then it's able to physically destroy uh, the object. Uh, now, the neat thing about this is on the read side, this could actually be implemented as uh, effectively a no-op. Uh, so uh, no memory barriers, no atomic operations, nothing. This is a very simpl simplistic implementation of uh, quiescent state-based reclamation, which is uh, the driver behind RCU. Uh, so in begin, you simply have a compiler barrier. On end, it's also a compiler barrier. 
And what we have here is, and this should be TLS n plus plus. Uh, we amortize things. So after every n SMR ends, we'll uh, update some timestamp, we'll st have a strong memory fence, and then reset this counter. All what the synchronized operation needs to do is, uh, at least in this simple, simplistic implementation, is grab the current time, iterate through all threads, and check whether their timestamp is greater than the timestamp that we perform. Now, the reason this is important is note that all the logical deletes are occurring prior to the synchronous synchronize uh, operation. So if threads have observed a timestamp greater than the current time, then it can also be guaranteed that the logical deletions prior to the synchronize are globally uh, visible. Uh, so once this occurs, uh, you are free to destroy the object. Uh, so this is a very cool, uh, you know, very cool mechanism. You have various implementations out there. So you have URCU, liburc.org, which implements QSBR, signal-based mechanism. You have Concurrency Kit, which uh, implements a high-performance version of epoch-based recommendation, uh, et cetera. Uh, and here's an example uh, performance between these various implementations. In this case, it's a head-to-head -head comparison of uh, a QSBR implementation, more performant than URCUs with EBR and a variant of epoch-based reclamation. Uh, all right, so now let's get talk about uh, lock freedom. So uh, formally speaking, non-blocking synchronization provides very specific uh, forward progress guarantees and high levels of resilience, uh, typically at the cost of complexity on the fast path. Uh, now, in the real world, these uh, you know, for, uh, actual non-blocking algorithms are typically used for the cases of resiliency, re-entrancy, re et cetera. So you'll see them a lot in device drivers, signal handlers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, now, there are cases to use them for performance, uh, but it's not a silver bullet, and we'll touch on that. So what lock freedom provides is system-wide progress guarantees. So if you do have a lock-free data structure, let's say like a, a lock-free stack, if one thread is for some reason stalled or has to retry an operation, uh, that, that situation only occurs if another thread has made forward progress. So at any given point in time, there is system-wide forward progress. One thread is uh, successful, is able to complete its operations. Weight freedom is stronger in that it provides uh, per operation progress guarantees. So for example, if you had a weight free stack and you had 10 threads doing uh, a push, those 10 threads will be able to complete that push operation at the same time and in a finite number of steps. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of, uh, how can I say, hype around uh, block freedom. Number one, it's, it's not a silver bullet. It does not mean that things will be faster. In many cases, it means things will be slower on the fast path. Uh, what you have over here is uh, uncontested, the cost of uh, various operations on a concurrent stack. You have a stack that's protected via spin lock, uh, doing a push, a uh, lock-free stack with a push, et cetera, pop as well. And what you can see, at least on x86, a spin lock-based stack has a significantly uh, better fast path compared to the lock-free stack. And that's because, uh, uh, at least on x86, you have to use more expensive atomic operations on the fast path, uh, et cetera. And other, other architectures, you'll have similar things, but you also have memory barriers, et cetera. So you, you really don't have the ability to amortize things. Um, so in many cases, the cost of complexity on the fast, fast path will outweigh the benefits until you have high levels of contention, and that's where things really shine. So over here, you have the latency distribution of uh, spin lock based stack. You have a thread pin per core, practically no jitter. And you could see that uh, you, know, you do have a very long tail as far as latency is concerned. Uh, the lock free stack, on the other hand, has significantly tighter bounds on latency. Uh, so the takeaway here is you know, don't assume lock free data structures will magically make your application perform better. They can provide predictability and just make sure that you do benchmark the, the fast path. Uh, 
Another major issue with lock-free data structures, primarily ones that uh, are dynamic, that require memory allocation, is you do require a runtime component to manage memory safety. So the stuff we covered with regards to hazard pointers and uh, uh, the passive mechanisms like RCU are, high, are a requirement to uh, utilize dynamic data structures uh, unless you do very hacky things like manage uh, free lists, etc. Uh, the other major issue, uh, you know, assuming you're not using something, well, even with hazard pointers, frankly, is for write-heavy workloads, things, these runtime systems start sucking. Uh, they start falling over. Uh, generally speaking, you want to use them for read mostly workloads. Uh, so for this, uh, there are a couple of things to apply. One is workload uh, special specialization. Uh, so that is bounding concurrency. So rather than using a data structure that supports an arbitrary number of readers or writers, fix the number of readers or fix the number of writers. So that greatly reduces the complexity of the data structure. Uh, the other piece is, <clears throat> in many cases, it can also mean you can get away from using heavy atomic operations. So at least on something like x86, where any atomic operation is going to be extremely expensive because it essentially serializes your pipeline, you could use regular load and store operations. Uh, so in, in the real world, you know, this is also a very common pattern. Uh, it's becoming more common in, in C++ uh, as well. So if you are using, uh, you know, an example, if you're using a dynamically allocated lock-free FIFO, switch to, if it's an option, switch to a statically allocated ring buffer, which still provides FIFO guarantees, you don't have the right runtime complexity. If you reduce uh, if you constrain the, con the concurrency around that too, you can end up with something that is you know, strictly a win-win. Your fast path will be better, program complexity will be reduced, resiliency will be increased, etc. cetera. Uh, so what, what I want to touch on here was uh, that particular example. Uh, so the ring buffer. Uh, the cool thing that I did want to highlight is, uh, you know, in the single writer, single writer case and single writer, single reader case, uh, you have weight freedom. And on x86, you also have no atomic operations or memory barriers on the fast path either. So you essentially get you know, optimal performance for free. And that's all because we constrained the level of concurrency. So there are implementations out there of this and concurrency kit, it's called CK ring. It's very tiny code uh, and it's, uh, yeah, feel free to grab it. Uh, another very interesting example is, is hash tables. So out there in the literature, most people focus on you know, generalized lock-free data structures, multi-reader, multi-writer. Typically, those uh, suck, uh, especially for an unmanaged language. Uh, so at least in the literature, there are, you, know, you have uh, chaining lock-free uh, hash tables. Uh, those have a couple of issues. Number one, they require a fair amount of memory management, which means you have to rely on things like RCU or epoch reclamation, et cetera. Uh, they also typically rely on very expensive operations on the fast path. Uh, and then they also inhibit the collision resolution mechanism. So in many cases, the way the chaining mechanism, is, the chaining mechanism itself uh, <laughs> is necessary to ensure the correctness of, of the algorithm. Uh, so if you wanted to do anything uh, more advanced with your uh, actual chaining, for example, sorting elements, et cetera, you would not be able to do that. Uh, now, uh, in open addressing, you do have a couple of things. So one of the more you know, popular implementations out there is Cliff Click's uh, hash table. Unfortunately, there are a couple of issues there. So for languages like C++ or C, you have a lot of complex constraints uh, around uh, key reuse. So it heavily relies on a garbage collector. Uh, for developers working in C++, they are not able to free uh, keys. Instead, the life cycle of keys has to be managed by the hash table itself, which gets fairly hairy. Uh, it's also fairly expensive on the right side as well. Uh, and it has limitations on the collision resolution mechanism. So the correctness of that algorithm is, uh, relies on um, you know, his particular uh, probing mechanism being implemented. So what does specialization get us? So uh, a couple of constraints uh, in this case. So uh, you know, 
for my application, so I don't care about termination safety, which is something that you know, Lock Freedom provides. If my program crashes, I'm screwed anyways. I don't care about the consistency of the data structure. Uh, we can constrain concurrency. So in this case, it is uh, a read mostly hash table, but there are bursts of millions of writes every couple of uh, seconds. Uh, so this can be, so I can constrain the write side concurrency to a single writer. Uh, we can also specialize things to x86. And that allows us to take advantage of the stronger ordering guarantees on x86, specifically load load ordering and store store ordering. Uh, so with this, uh, uh, I was able to develop a general technique for achieving block free, weight free single writers. Uh, and I would call this actually statistically weight free for readers. Uh, open address hash table with zero cost on TSO architectures such as 86. Uh, and fairly low cost for RMO and absence of deletions. The cool thing is uh, you don't necessarily have to rely on SMR techniques. Memory management is straightforward. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's just super fast. And what are TSO and RMO? Uh, so these are memory models. So total store, what is TSO and RMO? So these are memory models that processors tend to implement. So the most popular ones are TSO, which is total store. Ordering, which uh, essentially ensures that all operations executing on a processor uh, are ordered with the exception of store to load. So on TSO architectures, you could have store to load. You could have a load be reordered prior to a store, for example. ARM architectures is pretty much uh, a free for all. And that's so TSO is x86. Uh, later ARMs support TSO as well, but a majority of ARMs and uh, PPCs are uh, ARMO. So what that means for a developer is you have to be a little bit more careful as far as memory barriers are concerned, et cetera, to ensure that ordering of uh, uh, globally visible operations to memory are correct. Uh, so this is an example where you know, we, were, we specialized the data structure to our constraints, very simple algorithm. Uh, it's, it's fully generalized in that you, this could be implemented with Rob, Robinhood hashing. Uh, in our implementations, uh, we use linear probe, fallback to double hash, cuckoo hashing, etc. cetera. Uh, so how fast is it? So this is a comparison with uh, Google dense hash, which does not provide any of these nice properties for concurrent applications. And generally speaking, we're twice as fast, even as you scale to you know, many millions of uh, entries. Uh, so the nice thing here is you get those nice forward progress guarantees in a parallel system. So you have very tight bounds on uh, latency. Uh, it also increases simplicity. So a major uh, motivation for using a lot of this stuff, at least in you know, tech stacks I've worked in, is developers don't, worry, have, to, don't have to worry about locks or, or anything like this. Uh, and then this is uh, an example of the put operation. And this is Google dense hash versus read. This is a bit more interesting because uh, we also had a delete heavy workload here, which is typically where uh, these uh, open address hash tables do tend to fall over. Uh, so you do have open source implementations of all of this and the algorithm is also available out, the, out there. Uh, this has been ported to Java and uh, at least CKHT is also fully compatible with uh, C++. So this is the end. Uh, there was a lot of material. You know, I think a lot of the, every one of these topics warrants a full talk. Uh, I'm happy to follow up in greater detail offline. Follow me on Twitter. Here are a bunch of resources. Uh, so you have the Backtrace blog, which has a lot of tech write-up uh, with greater detail on these topics. Concurrency kit, BSD licensed library, which provides a lot of these primitives uh, that's used in many production systems today. LibURCU, uh, which is uh, developed by Matthew Desnoyers with, uh, in collaboration with Paul McKenney, and that's a user space RC implementation. Uh, Facebook's Folly is terrific. They have a lot of cool stuff uh, in there. They do have a simplistic, simplistic RC implementation, but they also have uh, event counters, which are lock-free uh, condition variables. Uh, this is a post on the hash table algorithm. 
introduction to non-blocking synchronization, you have a lot more depth, and then Paul McKenney's uh, perf book on multi-core synchronization, which is terrific. The last but not least, unfortunately, we didn't have time for this, something that's really exciting and a lot of folks are focusing their efforts on today are implementing uh, transactional memory systems using techniques like uh, RCU and the various passive safe memory reclamation schemes that I mentioned. Uh, this is not research. This is all, these are all things that you know, are used in the real world. I've used them all in the real world. Uh, this also includes the transactional memory systems out there. Uh, so you have read log update, which is fairly simple. It'll, you know, it doesn't take much to implement. Uh, and then you also have a great implementation called SSTM, which is an example of what you could do uh, if you specialize, uh, again, if you constrain concurrency with respect to a transactional memory system. Uh, so yeah, that is the talk. I'm happy if there are any questions offline. Let's talk. I'll just discuss it.